My suggestion is simply this. All that we cherish at the base of the great dream of America demands a dedication to the dignity of man, the God-given dignity of every human being. And what is the meaning of human dignity in our time and in our nation today? It means this, at the very least, that every human being be, be given equal opportunity to develop all those human qualities bound up in the wonderful expression of enjoying equal rights to life and to liberty and to the pursuit of happiness. And all Americans, whatever their race or color or religion or national origin, be given equal opportunity to participate in the political life of this nation by voting freely, north and south, by hope. Please welcome Jessica Pedrosa from the class of 2017 and a former resident of Welsh Hall, Family Hall. Jessica was a political science major and came to Notre Dame from Phoenix. She currently resides in Washington, D.C. and is a legislative assistant for the Honorable Ruben Gallego of the U.S. House of Representatives, Arizona District 7. I am the youngest daughter of Mexican immigrant parents who came to the United States to build a better future for their family. My parents did not have the opportunity to complete a formal education past the sixth and ninth grade. At a young age, they had to work to support their family. They've been working hard ever since. They had to learn to navigate a new country and a new language. And I guess navigating spaces that weren't meant for us is something that we share. I stand before you, a first generation college graduate of the University of Notre Dame. I have a bachelor's. I have a bachelor's in political science, a master's in teaching, and a day job in which I work to help shape policy and get to walk the halls of Congress. In preparing this speech, I thought about whether there was anything extraordinary about what I do or what I've accomplished in my short career so far. Something worthy of being invited to speak at a series inspired by a man with so many accomplishments and the courage to stand up for what he believed in. The thing is, all I have is my story. My personal experiences have been the basis of my advocacy for equity in education and beyond. I grew up in South Phoenix, Arizona, and attended a Title I elementary and middle school that had a majority black and brown student population and was considered underperforming. To me, it was just my school and my friends. It was a place where I thrived. I was in band and soccer and drama club. I was president of student council and valedictorian school spelling bee champion and will name the club, I was in it. It wasn't until an eighth grade teacher of mine, Mr. Wynn, that helped me through the process of applying to and attending a private, predominantly white, all girls college prep high school that I realized what inequity was. For four years, I attended Xavier College Prep, a high school with tuition that was inaccessible, an amount my parents could not afford on a landscaping and McDonald's salary. I could only attend with financial assistance. And every day I was keenly aware of the difference between my peers and me. They would either be dropped off or would drive to school in their cars, while I spent most of high school spending two to three hours either riding the city bus or waiting for one. I'd go to an office before school to collect my used books and donated uniforms. And even though I had been valedictorian of my middle school, academically I was years behind my peers. On occasion, I'd have to write or speak about how I didn't have enough money to attend the school and how grateful I was to attend. And it was true, I was incredibly grateful. I realized early on that I was receiving a quality education. And I was reminded of how precarious my education was, how I could only exist in this world as long as I was allowed to, when I went to withdraw right before my senior year because we hadn't gotten enough money to make the monthly payments. Luckily for me, they let me stay. Being there, 
it was very apparent that I was just one of very few students with my background to have the opportunity to attend. And I know that attending that particular high school was one of the reasons why I ended up at Notre Dame. Of course, I knew I wouldn't be able to afford college without a scholarship. And being at Xavier, I was exposed to the possibility of attending college and one out of state and one of the best. I was exposed to Notre Dame um, through QuestBridge, which is a scholarship program for high achieving low income students, um, as well as through a Xavier speaker uh, that came back. And I had the opportunity to come to Notre Dame for Spring Biz Weekend. And like many other students who come to Notre Dame, I fell in love with Notre Dame. Uh, it was beautiful. Everyone was nice to me. And I watched performances um, of the Black Cultural Arts Council fashion show and Mariachi ND and Ballet Folklorico, all of which I would later join. So I knew I wanted to come here. And as you may know, the college application process is stressful. For a first-gen, low-income student, it's extra daunting. You're navigating a system that your parents aren't familiar with and can't help you with. And let me tell you about the fear that you're putting in the tax information wrong in the FAFSA is real. High school was a lot of late nights, volunteering, staying up to do my homework, applying for scholarships, going to outside organizations that I'm really grateful for, like the Be A Leader Foundation, uh, that helped me apply for scholarships into college. And of course, you know how that story ends. I got into Notre Dame and with the full scholarship. Here's a badly photoshopped picture that I made um, of that teacher that uh, helped me in high school. He wasn't able to attend my high school graduation because he was teaching abroad at the time, but he has been a mentor to me uh, for the majority of my post middle school life. And he's a big reason why I became a teacher after college, uh, because I wanted to have a little bit of the impact on my students as he had on me. On the Facebook post that accompanied this photo, I wrote, uh, you may be halfway around the world, but you're also here in my heart, telling me that you're proud of me and that I'm one of the hardest workers that you know. You talked to my parents that one day at a parent-teacher conference and with such confidence told them that I could attend Xavier and that it was such a great opportunity for me. And when my parents stared blankly at you, when no one believed in it, not even me, you did. And today I'm a Xavier alumna, having graduated with straight A's, having received a full ride to Notre Dame, finally realizing that I did it but I'm not done, this is only the beginning. And it was only the beginning. <laughs> when I got to Notre Dame, um, although I very warmly remember that Father Joe Corpora um, left a note for me uh, in my dorm room because he knew that I, had been, uh, that I had arrived without my family, I felt the familiar feelings of not belonging. Others arrived with cars and with parents to help them move in. I, again, felt like a minority in a world that I didn't belong to, on scholarship again, and being a Latina, again, at a predominantly white institution. But I quickly discovered that I wasn't the only one. There were others who faced barriers and difficulties throughout their time at Notre Dame uh, because they were first generation or from low-income backgrounds or both. Students would talk about their parents not being able to attend JPW and them working and serving their classmates instead. Um, students uh, had to work, uh, aside from obviously the challenging academics of Notre Dame, uh, to supplement their financial aid and guard their flex points carefully. Um, others would not be able to go back home um, during Thanksgiving or Easter because they couldn't afford flights. Luckily, I was one of the few who, again, was able to kind of have these experiences because of uh, the scholarship that I had. I was blessed with the Anne Bryce Scholarship Foundation. And so I got the help that I needed. I was able to go to all the football games and um, they uh, get, gave me a computer for my academics and um, just really allowed me to have a full Notre Dame experience. And again, um, of course the challenges of academics were, uh, or the academics were challenging, um, especially because I had been so behind at my middle school. Um, I didn't get past pre-calculus in high school, and so calculus was really hard at Notre Dame. 
Um, but among all of those difficulties, um, I found community. And I wanted to create a community um, with other students who were like me. And so one of the things that I did when I was at Notre Dame is I, with my friend Kinga, started First GND. And we got together and we were a resource to each other and we could tell each other our stories and we could understand each other. We spent Thanksgiving together and hosted potlucks uh, for friends and strangers who for one reason or another were on campus during Thanksgiving. When I was at Notre Dame, I was involved in a number of different clubs. And each of those clubs required vulnerability. It required um, taking my own personal experiences and applying it to uh, the particular issue that I was advocating for at the time. Um, I was vice president of Student Coalition for Immigration Advocacy. And so I was involved in um, protests and demonstrations where I had to stand up, uh, sometimes to my peers, uh, to, to stand up for what I believed in, um, to debate uh, issues that were going on at the time. I was also involved in um, Sueños Sin Fronteras, exposing um, high school students to college as well. Um, it's hard to stand up for what you believe in. Um, it's hard to put your heart in your sleeve and, um, and be vulnerable about your, your experiences and why you're fighting for something. Um, anyway, I stayed true to what I wanted to do after college and I became a teacher. Um, I taught fifth grade science and social studies. Um, I loved my students. Um, I taught in Southwest Chicago, and I really wanted to make a difference. Um, but teaching is hard, and it's a lot of work, and um, teachers wear a lot of hats, especially in in, equi in, in, in in inequitable education system. And I wanted to do more, and I need to hurry up because I'm almost out of time. Well, I am out of time. Um, <laughs> So, um, I decided to stop teaching so that I could work on, um, on policy so that I can make a difference outside of the four walls of my classroom. Um, I became an education graduate fellow. I worked at Unidos US, one of the largest um, civil rights organizations working on Latino issues. Um, again, working on, on tough issues, um, I researched the uh, the impact of school resource officers on students of color, immigrant students, LGBTQ plus students, um, and had the opportunity to host a webinar. Um, eventually, I, um, I became uh, a legislative assistant in Congress. And um, because of my experiences, I, I try to expand equity uh, in not only in education, but in the intersections of um, of the issues that affect uh, low-income students, uh, communities of color. I want to work for equity so that all students, regardless of their zip code, socioeconomic status, immigration status, have the opportunity to receive a quality, quality education. I want to work toward equity so that all teachers are funded so that we don't have to crowdsource money from our network to buy school supplies. I want to work toward recruitment and retention of diverse teachers because I can count on one hand how many teachers and professors of color I had. I want to work toward college affordability because not everyone gets as lucky as I and can graduate without debt from college. I want to work so that our schools are safe for our children. Um, I want to continue advocating for immigration reform and equity in healthcare. Not everyone gets the same opportunities and access. I shouldn't have had to write dozens of scholarship essays and, um, and go to a school outside my neighborhood because there wasn't one in mine that was a quality option. I shouldn't have had to 
be on a billboard uh, to ask for uh, tax credit contributions for my funds to, um, to attend high school. Anyway, I don't always know the right things to say. I don't always get it right. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to stand up for what you believe in. It takes a lot of courage to uh, occupy out loud the institutions and spaces that, spaces that weren't meant for people like me. But because I loved Notre Dame, I worked to make it better. And because I love this country, I want to work to make it better. And I want to make the world a better place for my son. No matter where he grows up, I want him to have a highly, uh, access to a high quality education. And so one of the questions I think from uh, the prompts that we were given was what advice would we give? And um, I came up with uh, that we have to have the courage to stand up uh, even when, especially when your advocacy is unpopular, even when, especially when changing the status quo is hard, even when, especially when it makes people uncomfortable. And I end with this picture. It's my graduation cap. It says, Vuela tan alto como puedas sin olvidar de donde vienes. Fly as high as you can without remembering, without forgetting where you come from. So I don't forget where I come from. And that's why I advocate in the way that I do and will spend my career trying to expand equity for people.